Live from Los Angeles, it's theCUBE. Covering Open Source Summit North America 2017. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation and Red Hat. Hello everyone, welcome back to our special CUBE live coverage of Linux Foundation's Open Source Summit North America here in LA. I'm John Furrier, your co-host with Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Christine Corbett Moran, PhD at Astronomy, Astronomy Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellow at Caltech. That's right, it's welcome, mouthful. Welcome to the CUBE, <laughs> mouthful, but you're also keynoting, gave one of the talks opening day today after Jim Zemlin on Tech and culture and politics. That's right. Yeah. Which was, I thought was fantastic, a lot of great notes there. Um, connect the dots for us, metaphorically speaking, between Caltech and tech and culture and open source. What was, why, why did you take that theme? Um, sure, so I've been involved in programming since I was an undergraduate in college. I studied computer science and always attending um, more and more conferences, hacker cons, security conferences, that sort of stuff. Uh, very early on, what attracted me to technology was not just the nitty gritty uh, nuts and bolts of being able to solve a hard technical problem. That was a lot of fun, but also the impact that it could have. Um, so even as I went on a very academic track, I continued to make open source contributions, um, really seeking that kind of cultural impact. And it wasn't something that I was real vocal about, talking about, um, more talking about the technology side of things than the politics side of things. Um, but in the past few years, I think with the rise of fake news, with the rise of various sorts of societal problems that we're seeing as a consequence of technology, I decided I was going to try to speak more to that end of things um, so that we can focus on that as a technology community on what are we going to do with this enormous power that we yeah, have. And, and we'll get into that in a couple qu direct questions for you. It was an awesome, awesome talk. You got a lot in there. Yeah. You got a lot, you're riffing some good stuff there with Jim as well. But you had made a, a comment that you originally wanted to be a lawyer, went to MIT, and you started, you got pulled in to the dark side. <laughs> That's and right. Programming. Yeah. <laughs> As a former computer science myself, it's like, what got the what got the bug? Where, take us through that moment. What was the was it just you started coding? And, Damn, I love coding. What, what was the moment? Um, sure. So I was always talented in math and science, and that was part of the reason why I was admitted to MIT and chose to go there. Um, my late father was a lawyer. I didn't really have an example of a technologist in my life. So to me, career-wise, I was going to be a lawyer, but I was interested in technology. What kind of lawyer is that? Patent attorney. So that was my career path. MIT, some sort of engineering, then a patent attorney. I got to MIT and realized I didn't have to be an attorney. I could just do the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, For some people, that's, that's the fun part. Um, for me, it ended up being when I took my first computer science class, um, something that was fun, that I was good at, and that I really got addicted to kind of the feedback loop of, you know, you, you always have a problem you're trying to solve, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and then you get it to work, yeah. and then it's great for a minute, and then there's a new problem to solve. That's a great, that's a great story, <laughs> and I think it was very inspirational. A lot of folks watching uh, will be inspired by that. And, um, but the other thing that inspired me in the keynote was your comment about code and culture. Yeah. <laughs> and I love this notion that code is now at a point in open source is a global phenomenon. You mentioned Earth and space. Yeah. Because you know, involved in some of the space stuff, all Linux based now. But code can shape culture. Yeah. Explain absolutely. what you mean by that, because I think this is one of those things that people might not see happening right now, but it is happening. You're starting to see the more inclusionary roles and the communities are changing and code is not just a tech thing. Explain what you mean by code shaping culture. Well, we can already see that in terms of um, changing corporate culture. So for example, 10 or 15, 20 years ago, it might be inconceivable to make contributions that might benefit your corporate competitor. Um, and we all have corporate competitors, whether that's a nation, the US having competitors, whether that's your local sports rivalry, we all have competitors. But open source has really shown that um, you know, you're relying on things that you as a group, um, no matter what entity you are, um, you can't do as much as you can if you share your contributions and benefit from people around the globe. Um, so that's one big way that I've seen corporate culture and just everyday culture change that people have recognized that whether it's science or uh, corporate success, you can't do it alone. There's no lone genius. You really have to do it as a community. As a collective too, and you mentioned some of the the um, ruling class, and you're kind of referring to not 
ruling class and open source, but also politics, and that gerrymandering is a word you use. We don't hear that often in conferences, but the idea of having more people exposed creates more data. Talk about what you mean by that, because this is interesting, and more this truly is a democratization opportunity. Absolutely. Yet, <laughs> if not handled properly, could go away. Yeah, um, I think I, I am a little, I, I don't know if there's any Game of Thrones fans out there, <laughs> yeah, but you know, <laughs> at some point this season and previous seasons, you know, Daenerys Targaryen is there and they're like, well, if you do this, you're going to be the same evil person, just new face. And I think there's a risk of that in um, the open source community that if it ends up just being a few people, it's the same oligarchy, the same sort of corruption, just a different face to it. And I don't think open source will go that way, just based on the people that I've met and the community, um, but it is something that we have to actively guard against and make sure that we have as many people contributing to open source so that it's not just a few people who are capable of changing the world and have the power to decide whether it's going to be A or B, but as many people as possible. Yeah. Uh, Christine, it, the kind of monetization of open source is always an interesting topic at these kind of shows. Uh, you had an interesting piece talking about, you know, young people contributing, you know, contributing to open source. It's not just, oh yeah, do it for free and expect them to do it. Same thing in academia a lot of times. Yeah. It's like, oh, hey, yeah, you're going to do that research and, you know, participate and write papers and, you know, money's got to come somewhere yeah. to help fund this. How, how does kind of the money fit into this whole discussion of open source? Um, so I think that that's been one of the, the big big um, successes of open source, and we heard that from Jim as well today, that it isn't um, you know, some sort of unat unattainable in terms of achieving value for society. Uh, when you do something of value, uh, money is a reward for that. Um, and the only question is how to distribute that war award reward effectively to the community. Um, what I see sometimes in the community is there's this myth of everyone in open source getting involved um, for just the fun of it. And there's a huge amount of that. I have done a bunch of contributions for free on the side. Um, but I've always in the end gotten some sort of monetary reward for that down the line. And someone talked today about that makes you more employable, et cetera. And um, that has left me with the time and the freedom to continue that development. I think it's a risk as a young person who is going into debt for college to not realize that that monetary reward will come or have it be so out of sync with their current life situation that they're unable to give the time to develop the skills. Um, so I, I don't think that money is a primary motivating factor for most people in the community, um, but certainly as, as Linus said today as well, um, when you don't have to worry about money, that's when you do the really cool nitty gritty things that might be a risk um, that then grow to be that next big project. It's an interesting comment he made <laughs> about the US that he couldn't do potentially Linux if he was in the US. It opens up your eyes, you say, hmm, we got to do better. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, that brings up the whole notion of ra the radical comment <laughs> of open source has always been kind of a radical. And then, you know, when I was growing up, it was a tier two, you know, alternative to the big guys. Yeah. Now it's tier one. And yeah. I think the stakes are higher. And, and the thing that I'd like at your comment and reaction to is how does the community take it to the next level when it's bigger than the United States? You have China saying no more ICOs, no more virtual currencies. That's a potential issue yeah. as a data point of many other things that could be on the global scale. Yeah. <laughs> Security, the Equifax uh, fax hack, identity theft. Truth in communities is now an issue. Yeah. And there's more projects more than ever. So I made a comment on Twitter, whose shoulders do we stand on in the expression of standing on the shoulders before you? Yeah. There's You're standing of, on a sea. <laughs> so there's a discovery challenge of yeah. what do we do? With the, how do you get to the truth? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, that is a large question. I don't know if I can answer <laughs> it in a short <laughs> amount of time. Um, so to break it down a little bit, one of the, the issues is that we're in this global society and we have different portions trying to regulate what's next in technology. For example, China with the, the ICOs, et cetera. Um, one of the phrases I used in my talk was that the math is on the people's side. And I think it is the case still with um, a lot of the technologies that are distributed. It's very hard for one particular government or nation state to say, hey, this is, we're going to put this back in the box. It's Pandora's box, it's out in the open. Um, so that's a challenge as well for China and for other people, the US, if you want, if you have some harmful scenario, how to actually regulate that. Um, I don't know how that's 
going to work out moving forward. Um, I think it is the case in our community um, how to go to the next level, which is another point that, that you brought up. Um, one thing that Linus also brought up today that kind of is one of the reasons why it's great to collaborate with corporations is that often they put kind of the finishing touches on a product to really make it to the level that people can engage with it easily. That kind of on-ramping to a new technology is very easy. And that's because a corporation is very incentivized monetarily to do that, whereas the open source community isn't necessarily incentivized to do that. Moreover, a lot of that work, that final 1% of a project for the polish is so much more difficult. It's not the fun technical element. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the open source contributors, myself included, aren't necessarily very excited about that. However, uh, what we saw in Signal, which is a product that I've, um, I, it is uh, a nonprofit. It is something that um, isn't necessarily for corporate gain, but um, that final polish and making it very usable did mean that a lot more people are using the product. Um, so in terms of we as a community, I think we have to figure out how keeping our radical governance structure, um, how to get more and more projects to have that final polish. Yeah. Um, and that'll really take the whole community to And let them benefit the from level. it in a way that they're comfortable. And now it's not a proprietary lock-in, it's more of only 10% of most of the applications are yeah. proprietary or uniquely differentiated yeah. that's open source. Um, question kind of philosophy, take a thought experiment or just a philosophical question. Obviously astronomy and astrophysics is an interesting background. You got a, a world of connected devices. The IOT, the Internet of Things, includes people. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there looking at the stars. That's, oh, that's the Apache project, a lot of stars in that one. <laughs> you have these constellations of communities, if yeah. you will, out there, to kind of use the metaphor. And then you got astrophysics, you got the Milky Way, a lot of gravity around <laughs> the, you almost take a metaphor talks to how communities work. So let's get your thoughts. How does um, astrophysics and astronomy relate to some of the dynamics in, the, in how self-governing things work? Um, I'd Maybe. love to see that visualization, by the way, of the <laughs> Apache pro project and which, the Milky Way. That which one's the Big Dipper? That sounds uh, gorgeous. You, know. you guys should definitely. J John, you're going to fund something at Caltech. Uh, you know, it'll be our, our next uh, They'll argue fellowship. About who's the Big you know. Dipper or not? But you know, I, I, I think some of the challenges are similar uh, in in the sciences. In that, you know, people initially get into it because it's something they're curious about. It's something that they love, and that's an innate human instinct. People have always gazed up at the stars. People have always wondered how things work, how your computer works. You know, let me figure that out. Um, that said, uh, ultimately they need to eat and feed their families and that sort of stuff. And we often see in the astrophysics community um, incredibly talented people at some stage in their career leaving. Um, for some sort of corporate job. Uh, and retaining talent is difficult because um, a lot of people are forced to move around the globe um, to different centers in academia, and that lifestyle can be difficult. The pay often isn't as rewarding as it could be. Um, so to make some sort of parallel between that community and the open source community, um, retaining talent in open source, mm -hmm. uh, if you want people to not necessarily work in open source under Microsoft, under um, you know, a certain corporation only, but to kind of work more generally, um, that's something that ultimately yeah. we have to distribute the rewards from that to the community. It's kind of interesting, I always, I always thought Stu was interesting, the role of the corporation in open source always was trying to change the game, you know, you mentioned gerrymandering. The old model was, oh, we got to influence and slow that down, slow that down so we can control it. Yeah, so, so, so John, we've had people from around the globe and even that have made it to space uh, on the cube before. I don't know that we've ever had anybody that's been to the South Pole before <laughs> on the cube. So Christine, maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, how's technology, you know, what work in the, in the South Pole and what can you tell our audience about it? Um, sure, so I spent 10 and a half months at the South Pole um, not just Antarctica, but literally the middle of the, con the continent, the geographic South Pole. There the U.S. has a research base um, that houses up to about 200 people uh, during the austral summer months when it's warm, that is maybe minus 20 degrees or so. Uh, <laughs> during the cold winter months, it gets completely dark uh, and um, planes have a very difficult time coming in and out. So they close off the station to a skeleton crew to keep the science experiments down there running. There are several astrophysical experiments, several telescopes, um, as well as many research projects. 
and that skeleton crew was what I was a part of, 46 people, and I was tasked with running a telescope down there, uh, looking at some of the echoes of the Big Bang, and um, I was basically a telescope doctor. So I was on call, much like a sysadmin might be. I was responsible for the kind of IT support for the telescope, but also just physical, something physically broke, kind of replacing that. And that meant I could be woken up in the middle of the night um, because of some kind of package update issue or <laughs> anything like that. And I'd have to hike out in minus 100 degrees to, to fix this uh, sometimes. Oftentimes there was um, IT support on the station. So we did have internet running to the telescope, which was about a kilometer away. Um, it took me anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to walk out there. Um, so if it didn't require on-site support, sometimes I could do the work in my pajamas to kind of fix that. Um, so it was a kind of traditional computer support role in a very untraditional environment. That's an <laughs> IoT device, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stu and I are always interested in the, um, the younger generation as, as we have both have you know, kids who are growing up in this new digital culture. Well, what's your uh, feeling in terms of the younger generation that are coming up? Because people going to school now, digital natives. Um, courseware online isn't always the answer. People learn differently. Your thoughts on onboarding the younger generation and for the inclusion piece, which is super important, whether it's women in tech and or just people getting more people into computer science, what are some of the things that you see happening that excite you, and what are some of the things that get you concerned? Um, yeah, so I had the chance, I mentioned it a little in my talk, to teach 12 high school students how to computer program this summer. Some of them had been through computer programming classes at their colleges, or at their high schools, some not. Um, what I saw when I was in high school was a huge variety of competence in the high school teachers that I had. Some were amazing and inspiring, others uh, because in the U.S. you need a degree in education but not necessarily a degree in the field that you're teaching. I think that there's a huge lack of people capable of teaching the next generation who are working at the high school level. It's not that there's a huge lack of people who are capable, kind of almost anyone at this conference could sit down and help a high schooler get motivated in self-study. Um, so I think teacher training is something that um, I'm concerned about. In terms of things that I'm very excited about, we're not quite there yet with the online courses, um, but the ability to acquire that knowledge online is very, very exciting. Um, in addition, I think we're waking up as a society to the fact that four-year college isn't necessarily the best preparation for every single field. For some fields, it's very useful. For other fields, particularly engineering, maybe even computer science and engineering, um, apprenticeships or practical experience could be as valuable, if not more valuable, um, for less expense. So I'm excited about new initiatives, these coding boot camps. I think there's a difficulty in regulation in that you don't know for a new coding boot camp, is it just trying to get people's money? Is it really going to help their careers? So we're in a very frothy time yeah. there. Um, but I think ultimately how it will shake out is it's going to be, it's going to help people enter technology jobs quicker. And you know, there's a percentage of jobs that aren't even invented yet, so AI and yeah. you see self-driving <laughs> cars, and these things are easy indicators that, hey, society's changing. Yeah, and it's also going to be helpful for professionals like us, older professionals who want to keep up in this ever-growing field, and you know, it's not, I don't necessarily want to go back for a second PhD, but I'll absolutely take an online course in something yeah. that I didn't see in my undergrad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you can get immersed in anything these days online. It's great, and yeah. there's a lot of community behind it. Yeah. Christine, thanks so much for sharing. Congratulations on a great keynote. Thanks for spending some time on theCUBE yeah, with us. Yeah, thanks for having it. me. It's theCUBE live coverage here in LA for Open Source Summit North America. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. We'll be right back with more live coverage after this short break.